Over the years, we have been blessed with an abundance of strong, compelling characters from all corners of the Final Fantasy franchise. Their individual stories have engrossed millions of gamers around the world, and based on what we saw most recently with Final Fantasy XV, this is one particular aspect of the games that they have continued to get right, time and time again. What's impressive is that although there are of course specific tropes that have appeared across multiple games like the young, hyperactive schoolgirl, there was a permanent fixture for a number of years. Due to the concept of reinvention that has permeated throughout the franchise, the protagonists have still managed to feel rather fresh and exciting. This was the case with the aforementioned young, hyperactive schoolgirl characters, but that wasn't the only constant. For example, after Final Fantasy VI, where many characters could realistically stake a claim to being considered as the main protagonist, the cast of characters would typically feature a male lead protagonist, and he would have a female foil or two. It was a pretty clear dynamic, and it was incredibly successful for them. They were able to create compelling relationships between these characters that just resonated with people, and they were able to do so without diminishing the power and influence that characters like Aerith and Garnet had in their own right. It was just that there would always be a point in the story where they would take a step back, so that the main protagonist would have their moment to shine in the spotlight. With Final Fantasy X, this dynamic was challenged, and although they did still choose to have a prominent male protagonist in Tidus, they made the decision early on that there would also be a prominent female protagonist called Yuna, whose individual story would be equally important to the wider narrative. What that narrative would represent did go through numerous iterations, and at one point Yuna was positioned as more of a white mage who would be attempting to cure a deadly disease that would be affecting the people of the land, but core elements of her story were always retained, such as her connection with Yevon and her devotion to her craft. The developers also wanted to use Yuna to highlight that even if someone may seem to be physically frail, which was emphasised during our first encounter with the fledgling summoner, they can still achieve greatness through self-discipline, conviction and sheer force of will. Needless to say, the decision to promote Yuna's role within the story paid off, as they managed to successfully create a captivating narrative that cemented her position as one of the great Final Fantasy characters. And such was her impact that when they decided to greenlight a sequel, Yuna was named as the protagonist so that they could continue to tell her story. It means that with both the games combined, she ends up being arguably one of the most developed characters in the history of the franchise, and hopefully after watching this rather comprehensive look at this development, you will perhaps see Yuna in a different light. She wasn't your typical protagonist in either game, and I think that's what makes her rather appealing. The personal challenges she faced were unlike any we had ever seen before, and she just had this inner strength that you really didn't expect. Before we do dive into Yuna's origins though, I just want to remind everyone that even if you are already subscribed to Final Fantasy Union, make sure you hit that notification button to make sure you get notified when we publish new content. Also, make sure you let us know in the comments who you'd like us to see cover in a future Origins video. I'd also like to give a shout out to TPR for giving us permission to use his arrangements in this video. If you haven't checked out his melancholy albums, definitely do, there's a link in the description below. Alright, so let's get started with Yuna's origins. Yuna was born 17 years before the main events of Final Fantasy X took place, and she was born as the daughter of Braska, a Yevonite prince from Bavel, and a prominent woman from the Albed tribe and Yuna's birth acted as a positive first step for improving relationships between the two factions. There had been tension between the general, Yevon following citizens of Spira and members of the Albed tribe for over a millennia, but after Sid created a new place for them to congregate, called Home, Braska felt it would be an apt time to try and improve relationships between the two factions. And for a time, he was successful. Although there had been discord in the past, they were receptive to Braska's visits, and one woman in particular, who just happened to be the sister of Sid, was particularly enamoured during one of his visits. This complicated things, but they fell in love, and despite knowing that it could have unfortunate consequences, the two decided to get married in secret. When they found out, Yevon were appalled by Braska's decision to marry someone who they considered to be a heathen, and as punishment, it was decreed that Braska would be thrown out of the Yevon clergy. Sid, 
likewise, was disgusted by his sister's decision to marry a Yevonite and chose to disown her. It wasn't exactly an ideal situation, but at least they had each other, and despite being admonished by Yevon, they were still permitted to live in Bevel. And it was here, a year later, that their lives changed even further following the birth of their daughter, who they named Yuna, as a tribute to the famous Lady Yuna Leska, who had gained fame for being the first summoner to defeat Sin approximately 1,000 years prior. In contrast to their marriage, the birth of Yuna was welcomed by both sides, and although there was still tension, stances softened and wounds started to heal. It meant that, while things were by no means perfect, Yuna was able to have a somewhat stable early life alongside her parents. And such was the stability they felt that her mother believed that it was the right time to try and mend the damaged relationship she had with her family, perhaps so that Yuna would feel comfortable with her mixed heritage as she grew up. Indeed, before she left, Yuna's mother told her that if she ever needed help, that she shouldn't feel afraid to contact the Albed and seek out Sid. And so, Yuna's mother left, only to never return. What was meant to be a noble pursuit would instead turn out to be a rather fateful decision, as Yuna's life would be irrevocably changed as a result of what happened to her mother while she was en route to home. Sin had been known as the bane of Spira for over a millennium. Its role was to protect Dream Zanakin and to ensure it wouldn't be discovered by destroying any civilizations that grew to the point where they could become a potential threat. Unfortunately, many people were caught in the crossfire of this mission, and this was the case with Yuna's mother, who was killed before she could reconnect with Sid and apologise for what had happened years earlier. Yuna was only four years old when this happened, so was unlikely to have fully comprehended the gravity of what had transpired, but Braska was deeply affected. He had lost his soulmate, but it gave him a moment of clarity. Thinking unselfishly, Braska resolved to defeat Sin by becoming a summoner. He wanted to make sure that nobody else would ever have to suffer again, even if it meant his only daughter would have to grow up without any parents. Away from Yuna's eyes, Brasco prepared for this mission over the three years that followed, and he did so alongside a seasoned warrior monk called Orin. After then settling on the two guardians who would accompany him on his pilgrimage, Brasco said his farewells to Yuna and promptly left, leaving her behind in Bevel. It all happened very quickly, as Braska didn't want to have any excuses to stay behind. But even still, Yuna was allowed to meet and speak with a man named Jekt, who her father had only decided to make his second guardian literally just before leaving. They had limited time together, but Jekt still managed to show her the famed sublimely magnificent Jekt Sharp Mark III, and he even told Yuna some of his seemingly outlandish stories about Zanakin which she gladly indulged, because everything was just so exciting. Her father was going to become a great hero by vanquishing Sin, and he was travelling with a man from Zanakand. Not too long after, Yuna learned that her father had been successful. Sin had been defeated. She was initially filled with joy, absorbing the elation felt by everyone around her in Bevel. But then she realised for the first time that her father wasn't coming back and she began to fall into despair. When her mother had died three years prior, Yuna's father had been there to comfort her and provide love and stability. But now, now this small seven-year-old girl was all alone in the world, and she wandered around Bevel aimlessly, unable to sleep, and unable to share in the delight felt by everyone else in Spira. Perhaps seeking some kind of solace, Yuna ended up on the bridge where she had parted ways with her father, and as if by fate, she was found by Kamari, a Ronzo who had been sent there at her father's behest via Orin to take her far away from Bevel to a small village called Besaid. It was not something that either of them was prepared for. As a young child, Yuna was quite intimidated by Kamari's rather austere demeanour and appearance, and Kamari was certainly not used to dealing with a seven-year-old human child. But in the absence of any other parental figure, and perhaps because Kamari represented the only connection she had left to her father, when the time came for him to depart after completing his mission, Yuna begged Kamari to stay. And to her surprise, he did. It was the start of a very close bond that would form between the pair over the many years that followed, as Kamari would watch over Yuna as she grew up in the village of Poseid alongside Lulu, Waka, and his brother, Chapu. It was a rather close-knit community, and it helped Yuna to thrive despite the early hardship she had been forced to endure. 
Lulu, Waka and Chapu became like the family she never had, and they enjoyed their childhoods together. But Yuna couldn't shake certain feelings that lingered about wanting something more. And so, when she was 15 years old, Yuna resolved to follow in her father's footsteps as she vowed to become a summoner so that she could defeat Sin. Yuna had been inspired by the feelings of joy she saw in the people after her father had managed to defeat Sin, but she'd also seen the other side too, having witnessed the general sense of oppression that Sin brought back to the populace following the conclusion of Braska's calm. And it was by witnessing these events that Yuna became convinced that she wanted that sense of joy to return to the people of Spira, if only for a short period of time. Knowing what this meant for Yuna's life expectancy, especially as they lived in a village that housed one of the five main temples of Yevon, both Waka and Lulu were vehemently opposed to her decision. But Yuna was stubborn in her conviction, and proceeded to become an apprentice summoner with Kamari, her loyal protector, being named as her sole guardian. As Waka and Lulu then became guardians to summoners who subsequently failed in their quests, they then understood even more about the perils Yuna may face should she continue with her chosen path. And so they too decided to offer their services to the fledgling summoner, so that they could be close to her in times of need. It meant that when Yuna decided to undertake the first Cloister of Trials two years later, she did so knowing that she had the support of her closest companions. It gave her great strength, but the trial was a significant undertaking, and Yuna struggled to connect with the faith of Valfor upon its completion. She remained within the Chamber of the Faith for over a day, but despite the turmoil she faced during this time, a now weak and weary Yuna was successful in her communication with the Faith, and she was granted the official title of Summoner. Having been with many of the townsfolk for over 10 years, they were thrilled to learn of her success, but the dynamic of the village had also changed following the arrival of an unknown young man called Tidus. Waka had tried his best to defuse this unknown quantity, but that hadn't stopped Tidus from defying the temple precepts and angering many of the town's denizens. You heathen! Stay away from the summoner! Still, despite the obvious disapproval of Tidus being there, Yuna was curious. And when she then learnt from Waka about Tidus supposedly being a Blitzball player from Zanakin, this curiosity increased significantly. She had heard amazing stories from Jekt about Zanakin, and they had left a lasting impression on her due to how outlandish they were, but what if they were true? Yuna had a genuine sense of intrigue, and to her amazement, she learned that they had a shared connection. Jekt, the man who was her father's guardian, was also Tidus's father. Yuna took this as a huge source of inspiration. Their meeting could not be a coincidence, but before she could indulge this line of thinking any further, Yuna was reminded exactly why she had resolved to become a summoner to begin with, as Sin decimated Kilika Island before their very eyes, and upon arriving, Yuna was required to perform Ascending. It was an eye-opening experience, as despite being aware of the death and destruction that surrounded them in Spira, Yuna had lived in relative seclusion and safety for much of her life. Performing the Sending made her feel more connected to this cycle, and much like completing the Cloister of Trials in Besaid, it was something of a rite of passage on her journey as a summoner. The issue was that Yuna had struggled with both of these tasks, albeit for different reasons. This, combined with her rather large number of guardians, gave off the perception that Yuna was somewhat weak and naive. As the daughter of High Summon Nebraska, it was expected that she would have a natural aptitude, and after she had a brief parley with another summoner named Donna, it became apparent that while there were citizens who were pleased with her efforts, there were others who had much higher expectations for her. But while Yuna may have indeed struggled with the tasks she had been presented with, it became clear that she was no timid wallflower. Deep within her core was a fire burning. She had this strength of resolve and conviction that few others could match, and she let Donna know this, while still being polite of course. This strength would again be shown following some unnerving events that took place in Luca following their arrival. Not only was Yuna kidnapped by Samal Bed, only to free herself, but she also bore witness to fiends attacking the Luca Blitzball Stadium. Coupled with everything that had previously happened within Kilika, it was a tough chain of events. Yet, 
Even if she wanted to, Yuna could not let any of this outwardly affect her. As a summoner, it was now her duty to be seen as a beacon for the people of Spira. She had to be their strength, putting everyone before herself and offering assistance in times of need. So when she saw that Tidus was hurting, Yuna decided to offer counsel. This wasn't the first time she had noticed turmoil brewing within her new companion, but after the arrival of Sir Oren, who subsequently offered his services as a guardian to Yuna, Tidus seemed even more dejected than he had previously. It was clear that something had happened between the pair, but it was a private matter, and so, to try and cheer Tidus up, Yuna decided to open up and let her guard down by revealing what she did during times of sadness. Smile and laugh out loud. It was a small gesture in the grand scheme of things, yet it spoke volumes about how their relationship was developing. Yuna had known Waka and Lulu for many, many years, and she would often lean on them for support, but it was still quite a formal relationship. Likewise, Kamari rarely said many words. But with Tidus, Yuna had found someone who wasn't bound by custom. She could be herself around him without fear of judgement or reprimand, and due to their shared pasts and other similarities, she could talk to him and be heard. By opening up to Tidus, she also confirmed that this was a mutual feeling. And so, with the addition of Sir Orin to the group, the dynamic was rather well-rounded. As such, Yuna became convinced beyond any doubt that despite still having a long way to go on her quest, she would succeed with her pilgrimage and defeat Sin. And it was with this in mind that when they stopped at Rin's travel agency not too long after, Yuna felt it was an apt time to record her final farewells. It was a symbolic gesture, but true to form, Tidus interrupted her partway through and then proceeded to talk with absolute ignorance about what life would be like after Sin was defeated. This was somewhat heartbreaking for Yuna, as despite how comfortable she felt around Tidus, his spirits had lifted and she just couldn't bring herself to tell him the truth, that if Sin died, then so would she. The conversation was also enlightening in other ways, as Yuna realised that much of what she believed was built around faith and nothing more. Sin was such a prominent part of their lives, and they were taught via the teachings of Yevon to believe certain things around its existence, yet there was so much that she just didn't know. And as they then ventured forth and witnessed Operation Meehen in full force, it started to emphasise this point. Why would a maester of Yevon knowingly take part in a military campaign that was in direct violation to the teachings? It was a horrible event in general, and it made Yuna feel helpless. So many lives were lost, and all she could do was watch. In the end, the only use she had was performing the sending, so that those who had lost their lives wouldn't be turned into fiends. It was of limited consolation, but she did receive words of comfort and encouragement from Maester Seymour, and she carried those with her while obtaining her third summon and then continuing to heal the sick and sending those who had fallen. It was tiring work, but as they crossed the Moonflow, Yuna received some good news in the form of being attacked by someone who turned out to be her Albert cousin, Riku. She wasn't immediately overjoyed, of course, but after learning of their relationship, Yuna was thrilled and decided to make Riku her guardian, something which completed the group and promised to make their passage much easier. Well, in theory at least, as what was meant to be a brief stint in Guadalajara turned into something much, much more, as Maester Seymour asked for Yuna's hand in marriage. This was rather unexpected. Even though she was the daughter of High Summoner Braska, in her own eyes, Yuna was nothing more than a fledgling summoner who had a long way to go before deserving any kind of recognition on that level. Yet there were those who felt differently, and Maester Seymour was one such person. He believed that the marriage between a Maester of Yevon and the daughter of a High Summoner would help to overcome barriers of race and ease the suffering in Spira, much like the defeat of Sin itself would too. It would allow the people to focus on a single joyous moment. But what Yuna didn't know was that it was designed to be nothing more than a sideshow, part of Seymour's wider plan to become Sin himself so that he could end all suffering. Being the goody two-shoes Yevonite that she was and based on what she knew at the time, Yuna believed it offered some merit, and even though she had no romantic feelings towards Seymour, it would make people happy, and that was her ultimate duty. Nonetheless, it was a pretty big, life-changing decision, 
and it was further complicated by the fact that she had started to develop strong romantic feelings for Tidus. And so, Yuna visited the far plane, hoping that seeing the spirits of her parents would help her to pick the right path. But what she ultimately chose was the path of wider expectation. Yuna concluded that her personal feelings towards Tidus paled in comparison to the feelings of joy she could bring to the people of Spira, and by marrying Maester Seymour, she could bring joy to Spira in multiple ways. It seemed so straightforward, that was until she received a sphere from Seymour's father, Jiskel, which changed everything. Held within, Jiskel revealed that he had been murdered by his son, and he begged whoever found the sphere to stop him. This furthered Yuna's conviction that she should marry Seymour. Despite her perceived low standing, she still believed that her strength would be enough to influence Seymour to the point where he could be subdued. But after meeting him at Makalania Temple, Yuna realised that she had severely underestimated Seymour. He could not be contained in the way she thought, and after her guardians crashed the party, things escalated rather quickly. In the heat of the moment, Yuna was then forced to make another crucial decision that was rather unexpected. Upon deciding to become a summoner, Yuna knew that there would have to be sacrifices. Perhaps she didn't quite comprehend the size and nature of those sacrifices, but she knew that large parts of who she was prior to the decision would no longer belong to her afterwards, they would instead belong to the people. And with that in mind, Yuna was still willing to marry Seymour in spite of the atrocities he'd committed, as it would make the people happy, and she'd hoped to convince him to confess in exchange. Yet when he then threatened her guardians, Yuna chose to rebel against her role, acting selfishly for once, even though the potential consequences were dire. Because nobody had the right to threaten her friends, not even a Maester of Yevon. And Seymour paid the price for this threat with his life, as Yuna fought alongside her guardians to defeat the rogue Maester. Although it was the right thing to do, and in truth they had little choice but to act in the way they did, there were many unfortunate downsides to their actions. Due to his standing, few would believe what had happened, and this was especially true as Yuna was unable to send Seymour before she was forced to escape. No matter the reason why, they had attacked a Maester of Yevon, and a Guado one at that, and in doing so, they had made enemies of two big factions within Spira. And with the Albed then continuing and subsequently succeeding in their quest to kidnap summoners under the orders of Yuna's uncle, Sid, things were getting more complicated by the second. Yet this wasn't the end of this tumultuous sequence, as Seymour, now an unsent, was still adamant about marrying Yuna, and he then sent Guado to kidnap her from the Albed so as to force their marriage through under duress. By this point, Yuna was more than used to dealing with the pressure of expectation, but the game had now changed. People often had opinions about what she should do, and they often didn't agree with the decisions she would make, but at least they were still her decisions. Now though, people were actively trying to force and manipulate her for their own gains, and she had enough. Before, Yuna opposed Seymour because he threatened her friends, but now it was personal. And so, as the wedding commenced, Yuna decided to enact another plan that she'd need to carry out in isolation. She would send Seymour in secret during the ceremony. It seemed like a reasonable plan, but Yuna didn't count on the arrival of her guardians onto the scene. They were attempting to save her, but after being taken hostage by Maester Keenock and his forces, Yevon used them as hostages, forcing Yuna to go through with the ceremony to become Seymour's wife in the eyes of Yevon. This was an absolute violation of Yuna, and after Seymour then ordered her friends to be killed, she became filled with rage. Acting on the spur of the moment, Yuna realised that she had actually just become a valuable asset to the narrative Yevon were trying to portray to the people. But what use would the marriage to the daughter of High Summon Nebraska be if she then committed suicide? It was, of course, an idle threat, but Yuna's gamble paid off. Seymour had been outfoxed. He freed her friends, and once Yuna saw they were safe, she used her cunning to escape on the back of Valfor before heading to the Bevel Temple to acquire Bahamut. Yevon were naturally rather angered by this manoeuvre and they had Yuna and her guardians arrested immediately after they exited Bevel Temple. Yuna protested her innocence to the Maesters of Yevon, but her protestations were in vain. Maester Micah was just as corrupt as Seymour, and after she then refused to hear his proclamations, Micah sentenced her to death inside 
via Perifico. It had proven to be an effective means of punishment over the years, but there was always the chance that someone could still escape. And Yuna proved that assertion to be true, as they found an exit to the dungeon, defeated Isaru, a fellow summoner, and then squared off against Seymour yet again as he revealed to her his overriding plan. With Seymour now much more deranged, their situation was rather perilous. Sensing this impending danger, Kamari, Yuna's most loyal guardian, chose to preemptively attack Seymour. He was ready to make a final stand, to lay down his life so that she could escape and carry on with her pilgrimage, but Yuna was having none of it. Even going so far as to defy Sir Oren so that she could return to fight alongside Kamari, something which actually gained Oren's respect. Upon the conclusion of the battle, Yuna was left with much to reflect on. She had just learnt that Yevon was nothing more than a fallacy, but they were synonymous with the summoner's path. It created something of a quandary, but after talking with Tidus and sharing an intimate moment with him under the stars, Yuna knew that deep down, what she wanted to be was a summoner. Someone who could bring joy to the people. And after visiting the five temples of Yevon already, she no longer needed their support to continue to fulfill that role. She just needed to believe in herself and have the support of her friends. As Yuna then ventured onward to Zanakin, this self-belief was evident. Maester Kelk Ronzo had left the inner circle of Yevon after also learning of its corruption, but he was still a firm believer in its overarching teachings and believed that Yuna, through her actions, was an infidel. Yet after hearing that Yuna wouldn't back down to their threats of violence and was still adamant about proceeding with her pilgrimage despite everything that had happened, Kelk softened. He was impressed by the strength of Yuna's resolve, noting that despite her small frame, her will towered over even Gagazet's peak. To that end, Kelk let them pass, and after Kamari then showed his strength, the Ronzo vowed to stop anyone from Yevon who would attempt to follow. Riding this crest, Yuna progressed up Mount Gagazet, defeating Seymour again on the way, before ploughing through Unaleska's challenges that lay in wait throughout the ruins of Zanakind. But their biggest challenge was yet to come, as after learning that there was no faith of the final Aeon, Lady Unaleska dropped the bombshell that one of Yuna's guardians must sacrifice themselves to become the final summoning. Everyone discussed how best to proceed, as Yuna stood silent. As always, everyone else wanted to try and decide what was best for her future, and after Tidus attempted to take the lead, Yuna let everyone know in no uncertain terms that nobody was deciding her future other than her. And so Yuna decided to query Lady Unaleska, as it was important for her to understand what her sacrifice would actually mean. Every summoner believed that there was always a chance that Sin wouldn't come back if they defeated it, including her father. But Maester Micah had alluded to Sin being eternal. Was this really the case? Was Sin eternal? The answer Yuna received was not comforting, and it forced her to take an action that no summoner, at least none who had ever lived, had taken before. She would reject the final summoning. From an early age, Yuna had been convinced that she was destined to make the people of Spirit happy, and she had become a summoner to help achieve this objective, as her father had done before her. But she did so with the hope that sin could be abolished, that the calm that followed its defeat could be eternal. Now armed with the knowledge that what she craved was impossible through the means placed before her, Yuna chose to throw away tradition. She would find another way to defeat Sin without this charade of false hope, and if that meant that Lady Unaleska would need to be expunged, then so be it. And so Yuna proceeded to do just that. And with Unaleska now defeated, the group searched for another way to defeat Sin, and they were guided by the faith of Bahamut. With his help, and following a brief conversation with Maester Micah, they were able to discover more about the inner workings of Sin, and that the key to stopping its return was to defeat Yu Yevon. But they also learnt that a byproduct of this would be that each of Yuna's Aeons would cease to exist, as well as Dream Zanakand and Tidus. This was a heartbreaking revelation for Yuna. The pair had talked so much about all the things they wanted to do and see after Sin was defeated, like living on quiet shores, relaxing, or visiting the bright lights of Zanakind. 
At the time, they seemed like silly fantasies that were sometimes a little insensitive, yet now they were at the point where some of them could actually have become a reality, only for that possibility to be snatched away by a cruel twist of fate. Yuna had been stoic throughout much of their journey together, but she loved Tidus and wasn't ready to let him go. What other choice did she have though? They'd come too far on their journey and Tidus, despite knowing what would happen to him if Yuna succeeded, had supported her in this endeavour. She owed it to him to see it through to the end, even if it would be one of the most painful things she would ever have to do. And as Tidus faded away following the vanquishing of Yuyevin, Yuna thanked him for everything. Ever since she had decided to become a summoner, Yuna knew that her life was forfeit, but it was a decision that she owned. She also knew that her guardians would lay down their life to protect or serve her, but there had been multiple instances where she had chosen not to accept such a noble sacrifice. This though, was one such time where she had no control. Tidus had made the decision to lay down his life, not so that Yuna could continue to live and carry on with her pilgrimage, but so that her dream could be realised. It was such an unselfish gesture, and it showed just how much he cared for her. With tears in their eyes, they parted for the last time. But Yuna couldn't accept that Tidus was gone. So in the direct aftermath, she continued to search for Tidus in the hope that he would return. But it was ultimately a fruitless endeavour. And as time went on, Yuna started to believe that there was no such possibility. She had to accept that Tidus was gone. That was, until Riku came to her with a sphere that featured a man that looked oddly similar to Tidus, who was demanding to see the summoner. This was a rather curious development, and keen to find out more, Yuna joined the Gullwings, an owlbeard sphere hunting group led by Brother, Buddy, and Riku, who had grown in numbers following the recent talent acquisitions of a tech wid called Shinra and a highly skilled warrior called Pain. Such an activity would have been incomprehensible before the defeat of Sin, as most people dedicated themselves to survival. But despite only two years passing, Spira was now a much different place. Spira had splintered into new factions like the Youth League and New Yevon, Machina was now much more commonplace, and with Sin now gone, groups had started to hunt spheres with the hope of both finding treasure and learning more about Spira's past. New technologies had also become available in this time such as garment grids, created by Shinra to harness the power of newly created dress spheres, which when combined, allowed people to use enhanced combat abilities based on the memories of people from the past. Needless to say, because of these developments, the sphere hunting industry was a rather competitive and lucrative industry. There were individual groups like the Gullwings and their annoying rivals, the LeBlanc Syndicate, who hunted smaller spheres, but the bigger factions were also in the game, albeit for different reasons. Yuna though, wasn't interested in fame, glory, or simply learning more about Spira's past, she just wanted to know whether Tidus was indeed still alive. And with news then spreading about an awesome sphere that had been discovered in Kilika, this seemed like the perfect opportunity to find an answer to this question. Yet when they snatched it from under the noses of New Yevon, the Youth League and other sphere hunting parties, Yuna was left somewhat disappointed as it introduced doubts into her mind as to whether the man within the sphere was actually Tidus. Something just didn't feel right on multiple levels, and that was before even getting onto the crazy machina weapon that also featured in the recording. Now, using garment grids and dress spheres was all new to Yuna, and there were some side effects. When using the Songstress dress sphere, she'd started to inherit the emotions of whoever's memories it was based upon, and this was becoming more pronounced with every sphere they found relating to this mysterious man and a woman named Len who also appeared within the recordings. To the point where Yuna was having dreams about the events they'd seen, except the dreams were instead about her and Tidus, and they felt very real. Nonetheless, Yuna put these thoughts to the back of her mind, as after returning the awesome sphere to one of the main factions, they were told that the colossal weapon featured within the recording was Vegna Gun, a machina weapon created by the Bedor for use during the devastating war of a thousand years prior. They believed it would help them achieve complete superiority over the pro-magic users from Xanakind, yet the war ended before its use was ever necessary and it ended up as a forgotten relic housed within the lower caverns of Bevel. 
Yevon had been aware of this machina even prior to the defeat of Sin, but they had managed to keep it hidden away. Now with its existence becoming common knowledge, this posed an interesting dilemma. Yuna had initially joined the Goldwings with the hope of finding Tidus, but they'd now stumbled upon something that could potentially threaten Spirit all over again. It was a very real problem, and after LeBlanc brushed her ego, Yuna decided that she would again fight for Spirit's future. And so, they created a truce with the LeBlanc Syndicate, with the hope of finding Vegnagum beneath Bavel and destroying it. It seemed like a solid plan, but the catacombs beneath Bavel were not quite as they expected. Not only did they square off against an Aeon, but Vegnagon was missing. They did gain a new sphere though, but after watching it, Yuna became almost 100% convinced that the man featured within was not Tidus. But after speaking with Machen, she refused to discount the possibility that Tidus could actually be brought back. Right now though, they had bigger fish to fry. The new leaders of Spira had gone missing, and fiends had started pouring out of the temples. Yuna and the other Goldwings realised that they had indeed stumbled upon a new threat that could endanger all the Spira, and Yuna felt obligated to see this through to the end, as Spira's champion once again. Their first port of call was to visit the temples, but when they visited Jose Temple and subsequently fought against Ixion, Dark Aeon's final attack threw Yuna into the depths of the chamber all the way through to the far plane. When she awoke, Yuna was again wearing her songstress dress sphere, and she encountered the mystery man, Xu Yin, who had possessed Barilai, the leader of New Yevon. It led to a weird reconciliation between Xu Yin and the woman he loved, Len. They had both been killed during the Machina War after Xu Yin had attempted to steal and use Vegnagun against the Bador forces, but while Len passed to the far plane, Xu Yin did not. Due to his strong resentment and malice, he clung to the world, becoming a twisted shadow of a being. During this sequence, Xu Yin revealed his plan to use Vegnagon to end Spira's constant warring. It was a nice thought, but there was an unfortunately large downside. Much of Spira would likely be destroyed as a byproduct. And following this rather alarming encounter, Yuna met up with Nugent Gipple, two of the other leaders of Spira. They handed her some spheres that they felt would be useful, and left Yuna to attempt an exit from the far plane while they enacted a wider plan. The trouble was, Yuna had no idea how to get out. Going round and around in circles, she became incredibly frustrated. But as she was on the verge of giving up, Yuna heard a familiar sound, Tidus's whistle, and it guided her out to safety. Despite knowing of Xu Yin's plan, the Goldwings were unsure about what to do next, as well, they had no leads to go on and it seemed like Nuge and Gipple had some kind of plan that they weren't willing to share. So with Spira entering into a rather tense patch with its leaders all gone, Yuna decided to try and unite them by holding a concert. It was just what the people needed. Their bickering stopped as Yuna burst into song using her songstress dress sphere and they got to witness something that put things into perspective. Perhaps due to the electricity that surrounded them in the Thunder Plains, Len's memories of her final moments were projected for all to see, and her sad end resonated with everyone in attendance. They wouldn't let that happen again. And after speaking with Machen, it gave Yuna some new perspective too. Xu Yin and Len were similar to her and Tidus in many ways, but there was a key difference. Xu Yin never got to know how Len felt. Yuna realised that perhaps she could quell Xu Yin's rage if he only knew, and so she decided to go back to the far plane to tell Xu Yin the things he didn't know about how Len felt. When she arrived, Yuna learned that things had escalated. Through the possession of Barilai, Xu Yin had gained control of Vegnagon and was gearing up to use it. Nuj, realising things were rather desperate, was willing to sacrifice himself and Barilai to save everyone else. But this gave Yuna unfortunate flashbacks and she protested. Two years prior, Yuna was forced to sacrifice her allies so that Spira could be saved. She believed it was the only way and accepted that it was a necessary evil, and it was a success. But the praise she received afterwards felt hollow as she couldn't enjoy it with those who deserved to be there with her. If there was now a choice, Yuna didn't want to go down that path again. And so, along with Riku and Pain, they fought Vegnagun before successfully revealing Len's feelings to Xu Yin, something which calmed his spirit and let him rest. As Yuna prepared to leave, she was visited by the Faith of Bahamut, who 
who asked if she wished to see Titus again, something to which she said yes, and as if by magic, he was brought back to Spira, arriving in Besaid. But the Titus that returned wasn't quite the same as the Titus who Yuna had known two years prior. The Faith had done their best as they attempted to gather what they knew about Titus to bring him back, but some things were missed out and Yuna would start to notice this as they prepared to celebrate their victory and welcome Titus back. During the preparations, Yuna, who hadn't been back to Besaid for some time, spoke to the village elders. Their lives had been turned upside down by the events of the last two years, as many of them had been ardent Yevonites, and when Yuna had exposed the organisation, they ended up feeling lost. Seeking solace, Yuna attempted to talk to Titus about these feelings, but he didn't understand. From his perspective, they had saved Spira from sin, so why should Yuna feel guilty that some phony religious beliefs were being taken from other people? But given that Yuna had also grown up with these same religious beliefs, she felt Titus was being rather insensitive and for one of the first times the pair argued. They highlighted to Yuna that their relationship was different now and it made sense. She had grown as an individual while Titus had been gone and Titus wasn't quite the same as he was before. If they wanted this to work, they would need to learn about each other all over again. But before they could worry about their relationship goals, they were seemingly transported a thousand years into the past by a freak storm, and as they explored their new surroundings, Titus was killed by a bomb. Yuna was stunned and passed out due to shock. As she dreamed, she was visited by a summoner from the past who explained to her where they were and why. They were stuck in an alternative world, attempting to solve a riddle, but when they escaped, Yuna came to learn that she had beckoned Titus back due to her feelings for him and that if he were to find this out, he would disappear forever. With Titus also separately realising that he may disappear at any moment, the two just promised to cherish each other while they could, and so Yuna decided to leave the Gullwings to settle down in Besaid like she dreamed of doing during her pilgrimage. Three months later though, Yuna was mysteriously summoned back to Luca along with the other Gullwings to explore somewhere called the Utisa Tower. But as they climbed, the trio began to realise that although they had spent a lot of time together, they wanted different things. It was their previous shared goals that kept them together as a group, and now that those goals no longer existed, there wasn't much they actually had in common. For Yuna, she was just focused on enjoying her time with Tidus and told her friends as such, but after learning that it was Payne who had written the letter and asked them to investigate the tower, Yuna decided that they should still try and reach the top of the tower even if it was causing strain to their relationships, as it would help them to understand whether or not there was actually a relationship worth saving. By the end, they realised that they should cherish their moments together, as although they'd changed a lot and would go their separate ways, they still had had a lot of fun. And so, after scaling the tower, Yuna went back to Besaid to live a quiet life, but things didn't pan out quite as she'd hoped. While spending time with Riku and Pain, she had realised that circumstance had brought them all together and forged friendships that had no real bond beyond the superficial, and with Titus, she had noticed similar things. Unlike Yuna, Titus had no strong connection to the world they lived in, so while Yuna chose to stay in Besaid, acting as a priestess and advisor to a group called the Yeveners who followed the moral teachings of the original Yeven, Titus moved to Bavel to pursue a career in Bitsball. They stayed in touch, of course, but their relationship wasn't as active as it previously had been and this suited Yuna, as she had become very worried about Titus finding out that she had beckoned him back. But when two individuals called Chuami and Kurgum showed Yuna a sphere under the direction of Baralai, who was now the Chancellor of the Spear and Council, Yuna decided to head to Baval to learn more. She was also concerned about Tidus, who had been suffering numerous injuries due to being physically weaker since his return. When she then arrived in Baval, Yuna learned that Sin had returned, and she rushed to reconvene with Tidus as soon as she could, for worry that he had been affected by Sin's return. But given their recent history, Yuna also wanted to keep her distance. It was a rather complicated situation. With Sin returning though, Yuna once again resolved to find a way to defeat it, and she delivered a rousing speech to the crowd in Bavel. She would become Spira's hero once again in its time of need. And so, that concludes the story of Yuna, so far at least. Who knows whether they will ever choose to build upon that cliffhanger though, as it's been years now since they teased additional content for the universe of Final Fantasy X 
and we've not seen anything really other than the creators saying that they're too busy to make it. I personally though would love to see a continuation because Yuna is such an intriguing character on multiple levels. She was introduced in Final Fantasy X as someone who had an iron will but was also a physically weak frail person. It was such an interesting juxtaposition and not something we'd really ever seen before in a main protagonist. But I think that's what makes Yuna rather special. She developed as a character in multiple ways, some of them subtle and some of them not so much. And I still remember even in the earlier parts of the game where we got glimpses of just how driven Yuna was as there were numerous points where you could tell that people were tutting at her actions but she just didn't care and just carried on anyway because it was her life and she felt like she had the right to do what she wanted. But then you have the interesting complications of she does what she wants as long as it's for the greater good of Spira. It makes the scenes where she doesn't get to do what she wants all the more meaningful and it's because of these additional facets that I find her so intriguing. With Final Fantasy X 2, while Yuna was promoted to being the de facto main protagonist, there wasn't actually as much character development for her, but within the game's final scenes, we got to see just how much the events of Final Fantasy X had affected her, and as a fan of Yuna, the scene that plays out just before fighting against Vegnagon is so extremely well written and meaningful for who Yuna is as a character that in my opinion, it's definitely worth the price of admission. Yuna was just designed to be the embodiment of self-sacrifice, self-discipline and willpower, and through fantastic scenario writing from Najima, Toriyama and Watanabe, I feel as though we got to see these traits blossom into one of the most unique protagonists in the franchise. But yeah, with that small analysis out of the way, this marks the end of Yuna's Origins video. Thank you all so much for watching. This video has been such a significant undertaking for Lauren and myself due to the sheer breadth of source material and we really appreciate your support in the creation of these videos. If you've made it this far then my god you are an absolute legend. Please give yourself a pat on the back in the comments as a badge of honour and to let us know that you made it that far and you enjoyed the video. Which if you did, please also hit that like button, share this video around to all the people you know who love Final Fantasy X and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel. Also be sure to let us know what you thought about the video and feel free to let us know what Yuna means to you as a character. We'd also love for you to join us as we continue to grow this channel. If you'd like to support us, please check out our Patreon link in the description below. You can support Lauren and myself for just $1 per month, but we also have other tiers available too. For $5 per month, you can gain access to new behind the scenes content where Lauren and I talk about how we actually go about creating these videos. But we also have Patreon exclusive activity feeds, a Discord server, and you can also get your name at the end of videos like these guys you're seeing right now. We really want to make it as inclusive as possible though, so if there's any other things you would like to see, please do reach out to us and let us know. Alright everyone, thank you so, so much for joining me on this deep dive into the lore of Final Fantasy X. This was, as I mentioned, a significant undertaking. It's by far the longest video we have ever made. And with that, this is Daryl, signing out. I will see you next time for more Final Fantasy videos.